point out uh, we're getting to that point in the semester where there are many events uh, going on each day. Uh, today at 3 o'clock we'll be hosting a workshop on careers in the Foreign Service sponsored by the Foreign Service Student Organization. Uh, please come, you'll have an opportunity to interact with uh, Mr. Jordan Tanner, who's a retired Foreign Service officer and former Utah legislator. Also, uh, several students who have taken the written and oral exam. Uh, again, that's at 3 o'clock in this room. Uh, and then tonight at 7.30 p.m. in the JSB Auditorium, uh, the Wheatley Institution, in partnership with the Kennedy Center, will be hosting Mr. William H. Webster, who's the chairman of the Homeland Security Advisory Council. He is also the former director of the FBI and the Central Intelligence Agency. He'll be speaking on managing intelligence and security in today's world, uh, America's response. And that will be at 7.30 tonight in the JSB Auditorium. Uh, a number of our student organizations are hosting their first events. Uh, I'll just mention one. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock, those of you who are thinking about law school, the International Law Student Association will be hosting Professor David Moore, who is a professor of law um, at the law school. He'll be speaking at 11 a.m. in 303 of the J. Reuben Clark building. Uh, he'll be speaking about the fundamentals of international law, and ILSA is one of the 13 student organizations that we uh, sponsor uh, to help students uh, network and, and develop contacts with faculty and fellow students and also to learn about uh, career and professional opportunities. So uh, this is just one of, of 13 different groups. Hopefully, uh, if there's a region or a part of the world you're interested in or if you're interested in international relations, uh, there's also a, a Sigma Ida Row chapter. So take a, take a moment to check our website and you can uh, catch... Uh, the latest in terms of events and activities that are ongoing. Um, the last lecture I'll mention tomorrow at 4 p.m., uh, the Political Affairs Lecture Series, Practical Politics and Policymaking with Mike Knudsen, who's a, a lobbyist, and we'll be talking about the world of lobbying. Uh, this is a series uh, developed by the BYU Political Affairs Society and the Department of Political Science in partnership with the Kennedy Center and the College of Family Home Social Science. Uh, you'll notice each of those lectures are held Thursdays at 4 p.m. here in the Kennedy Center. And again, they provide uh, um, windows into various uh, uh, public sector careers. Um, so uh, some great activities and events going on, and that's just scratching the surface. Our website, kennedy.byu.edu, is sort of the, the central location for all of the calendar events. And then if you want to sign up for email updates or follow us on the blog, you can uh, follow our RSS feed, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you prefer. We hope you'll just come and uh, look forward to seeing you at, at, at events like this. We'd like to begin with an opening prayer. We've asked Victoria Fox, who's a comparative literature major from Salem, Oregon, to offer the opening prayer, and then I will introduce uh, Senator Garn. Victoria? Lord, Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the peace of the gospel and for thy son, Jesus Christ. And we um, pray that we can turn to him as we discuss these issues. And we pray that as we um, listen attentively to the lecture today, that we'll be able to understand the complexity of the issues that we face and that um, we'll also have the hope to continue working towards resolution and that we'll have compassion for other peoples and cultures, especially those people in areas of conflict and strife. And we pray that we can have an increased love for thy children. And we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Victoria. E.J. Jake Garn retired from the U.S. Senate in 1993 following 18 years of service to return to Utah and is currently a self-employed consultant. Uh, Senator Garn serves on the board of the United, United Space Alliance in Houston and he's also involved with numerous local, private, and public sec sector endeavors that include Capmart Bank, BMW Bank of North America, Headwaters Incorporated, Franklin Covey, New Skin Enterprises, and Primary Children's Medical Center Foundation. In December two 1992, Senator Garn received the very prestigious aviation award, the Wright Brothers Memorial Trophy. In November 1984, Senator Garner was invited by NASA to fly as a payload specialist on Flight 51D of the Space Shuttle Discovery. During the seven-day mission, he performed various medical tests before they landed at Cape Canaveral on 19 April 1985 after orbiting the Earth 109 times. While serving in the United States Senate, he served six years as chairman of the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, was a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, 
and served as a chairman of the Veterans Affairs, Housing and Urban Development, and Independent Agency Subcommittee for six years. He served on the subcommittees on Energy and Water Development, Defense, con Military Construction, and Interior, was a member of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and served on three subcommittees, Public Lands, National Parks and Forests, Research and Development, and Water and Power. Senator Garn was also a member of the Senate Rules Committee and served three terms as Secretary of the Republican Conference. Prior to his Senate service, he was the mayor of Salt Lake City and an insurance executive. A former U.S. Navy pilot, he's a retired Brigadier General in the U Utah Air National Guard and has logged more than 12,000 hours of pilot time. A native of Richfield, Utah, Senator Garn attended Utah Public Schools and received a Bachelor of Science in Banking and Finance from the University of Utah. In 1957, he married the late Hazel Thompson, and they had four children, Jake, Jr., Susan, Ellen, and Jeffrey. In 1977, he married Kathleen Brewerton and has a son, Brooke, from a previous marriage. They have a son, Matthew, and a daughter, Jennifer, and 20 grandchildren. Today's topic, A World Without Nukes, Perspectives on the Policy and Politics. Please join me in welcoming Senator Jake Garn. Thank you very much. I'm uh, pleased and honored to be with you this morning. And it may surprise you that after that resume and find out I'm a military pilot that I'm opposed to nuclear weapons. And I'll give you a little background on where that is coming from and how strongly I feel about it. Back in the days when I was a young Navy pilot, I was stationed in Iwakuni, Japan and Sangley Point in the Philippines. And interestingly enough, in the days when I was your age and younger, I had never been out of the state of Utah. You didn't travel very much. And I came home on a Saturday once, and Mother said, what are you so excited about? And I said, Mom, I've been out of the state. And she said, well, I said, well, we drove up to Bear Lake and decided none of us had been out of the state, so we drove across the border and went to Montpelier, Idaho. So 19 before I ever left the state and all the way to Montpelier. Well, the next year I went on my first midshipman cruise as a young Navy midshipman. Dedenborough, Scotland, Oslo, Norway, and La Havre, and the Navy recruiting posters join the Navy and see the world were absolutely correct. Not only did I see the Earth as a young Navy pilot, I was stationed in Iwakuni, Japan, and as I mentioned, Sangley Point in the Philippines, and flying essentially spy missions up and down the east coast of China, from Tsingtao in the north down to Hainan Island, and uh, checking on all the shipping coming in and out of the Chinese ports. And uh, so it was quite a change for this kid that was 19 before I ever left the state to live in Southeast Asia and perform those duties in behalf of my country. Now, we were not armed to defend ourselves, but one of my most prized pitchers was sometimes the MiG-15s would come out to harass us, and our defense would go down about 100 feet off the water, put the flaps down, and pull back the power and slow down below 100 miles an hour because the MiGs couldn't fly that slowly. That was our defense. Get rid of them by flying so slowly. And I have this remarkable picture of a MiG-15 right under my wing with a Chinese pilot with a big grin on his face waving to me. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. In fact, I've got it in my home office from all those years ago. But I bring that up to illustrate how things have changed so dramatically over the years. Because this young Navy pilot, who when I got off active duty, uh, had to keep flying, so I transferred over to the Air Force Reserve and spent 20 years in the the Air Force, and my father was a pilot in World War I, the first native-born Utah to ever hold a pilot's license, signed by Orville Wright. And then I have a son who's an airline captain, and his oldest daughter is a junior up at Utah State, where a lot of people don't realize they have a great aviation program up there, not only flight training, but a lot of different academic degrees in aviation as well. And uh, she said, Grandpa, a couple of weeks, she said, I love you. But it's time we had a female Garn pilot. I'm sick of you arrogant Garn men. <laughs> so she's fourth generation. 
to uh, fly. But what an incredible change in my life to have that experience of serving uh, literally all over the world, but specifically in Southeast Asia. Now, it's interesting then to progress from that because I never would have thought that I would have the opportunity to orbit the Earth 109 times at 25 times the speed of sound because I was 27 years old before Sputnik flew. In fact, I was stationed in Japan and came back to our base in Iwakuni and everybody was jumping around in the ready room. What's going on? I said, the Russians have a satellite and it's orbiting the Earth at 25 times the speed of sound. So even at that point in my life, if somebody had said to me, well, you will fly in space. Yeah, sure, Will, and what have you been smoking? <laughs> because how, even with my wild imagination, to go from Sputnik to think that I would be an astronaut on orbit the Earth and space travel would become so common as it is today. Although there's still only slightly over 500 people who have had the opportunity to be in space, but someday, it will be as common as airline tra travel is today. There is no doubt about that in my mind at all. All of you will probably have the opportunity to do that in, in your lifetimes. But it's an amazing experience, not only from the beauty of looking back at the entire Earth. You orbit the Earth every hour and a half. You have 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every day. 45 minutes of daylight and then 45 minutes of darkness. So a watch is worthless, except as a countdown timer. So when you go through every 24 all 24 time zones every hour and a half, what good is a watch to, uh, to look at? But the thing that's absolutely amazing about it is how it changes your attitudes about this earth and the human beings who live on it. You look out into space and realize that there are more galaxies out there than all the individual grains of sand on every beach on Earth. And we think we're important on this little speck of dust called Earth and we've got to fight and kill each other. It simply makes no sense at all when you've had that perspective of viewing the Earth as I and 500 other people have. And to illustrate my point most strongly, Alexei Leonov is a retired Russian Air Force Major General who was the first human being to do a spacewalk. And he and I are brothers because we belong to the Association of Space Explorers. We meet someplace around the Earth every year as astronauts and cosmonauts. I hosted it in Salt Lake in 2005. And last year in October, it was in Czechoslovakia. And the year before that, it was in Scotland. And this year, next month, it's in Kuala Lumpur. And so the astronauts and the cosmonauts get together someplace around this Earth every year. And we talk about our shared experiences of having viewed this Earth from space. And I'll never forget, I decided that I would not host it in Salt Lake unless we had an astronaut or a cosmonaut or both visit every school district in the state. And so I took Alexei to Richfield, my hometown, and he stood up on the stage and he said, I'd like you know that I'm a retired Russian major general, cosmonaut, fighter pilot. Senator Garn was both a Navy and an Air Force pilot in the United States, and he's my brother. Because we have seen this Earth from space and those are the relationships we have. And it simply doesn't matter where you live, what language you speak, the color of your skin. We are all children of God traveling on Spaceship Earth together. And it doesn't make any sense the way we treat each other. None whatsoever when you realize how small we are in the overall scheme of things. So beyond the thrill of an old military pilot flying in space, it is a life-changing experience in terms of our attitudes, how we feel about each other, the relationships we have, and these ridiculous artificial differences that we create to discriminate uh, against each other. So I'm looking forward in a couple of weeks to see Alexei give him a big hug in Kuala Lumpur. And those relationships will continue forever. 
So someday when space flight becomes as common as I mentioned as airline travel is today, it will have a dramatic effect on how human beings on this planet treat each other, change our attitudes absolutely dramatically, and recognize how small our planet is in the overall scheme of things. As I mentioned, you orbit the Earth every hour and a half. If you can imagine being able to see the entire Mediterranean Sea all at one time, see Spain and Portugal and Gibraltar and North Africa and France and Italy and Greece and the Greek Isles, and the Nile River flowing northward from the Red Sea. It's just uh, amazing. My wife said that someday when I have Alzheimer's and can't remember who she is, I will remember every detail of my space flight. And I'm sure she is probably uh, correct in that. And so I just wanted you to have that background so that you understand where this old military pilot is coming from in wanting to do away with nuclear weapons because a lot of people are upset. Oh, gee, ex-military pilot, you want to endanger our country? And it doesn't make any sense, particularly with your background. Yes, it makes a lot of sense because of my background and what I've described to you about how we're all children of God traveling on a spaceship Earth together. And so I am actively involved in working someday on achieving that goal of no nuclear weapons. And General Brent Scowcroft, who I knew well while I was in the Senate, and he's a retired Air Force uh, Major General, and he and I have been working together with Global Zero in trying to let people understand that even a couple of old military pilots would like to get rid of those weapons because they make no sense whatsoever. So the big problem is not Russia and the United States. Although we've each got tens of thousands of nuclear weapons, that doesn't worry me at all. What worries me is the North Koreas and the Irans and some of these rogue countries with their crazy dictators who think they know everything and can tell everyone else uh, what, what to do. And so that is our biggest problem of those smaller countries, and North Korea definitely has that ability, and Iran and some other small countries are close to it. And so it is a high priority with me to try and attempt to do away with nuclear weapons. Now, a lot of people are surprised, as I mentioned, that an old military pilot would feel that way. The key, the absolute key, is verification. I would never, ever favor signing and having Congress agree to a treaty unless I was satisfied that we could verify that we could enforce it. It wouldn't make any sense for the United States and Russia to do away with our nuclear weapons if we couldn't prove that North Korea didn't have any, or Iran or some of these other rogue uh, countries. So if you don't remember anything else I say this morning, verification to a nuclear weapons ban is absolutely critical. And no matter how well the treaty is written, if it cannot be verified, we should not agree to it and endanger our country. But I do want to emphasize one more time the fact that someday everybody will have the opportunity to fly in space. It will become commonplace. And if you don't remember anything else, I say how, what a dramatic change that will make and how we treat each other on this little tiny planet called Earth that we are traveling on uh, together. Now, I want to uh, open it up for questions, even at this point, for two reasons. First of all, I'd much rather answer your questions. And secondly, to prove that it's possible for an old U.S. senator not to filibuster, just to go on and on and on and <laughs> talking without saying much of any, uh, any substance. But I would encourage you to work towards this goal of not only doing away with nuclear weapons, but recognizing it doesn't matter where we live, what language you speak, the color of our skin, whether we have hair or whether we do not, we are all children of God traveling on Spaceship Earth together, and it makes no sense 
the way we treat each other, none whatsoever. Questions? If you don't ask questions, I'll give you another speech, so I'm trying to encourage you. Yes, right here. Hi, my name is Aaron Day. I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah, and I'm a history major. Uh, during the recent uh, senatorial primaries, both Mike Lee and Tim Bridgewater said that they were in favor of nuclear, of starting up again nuclear testing. To what extent do you think this demonstrates a disconnect between senators, those two, p those two senatorial candidates, and the state of Utah when test nuclear testing had such a devastating effect on Utah and its citizens? Well, it isn't just here in Utah you're getting that. You've got those who are in favor of doing away with and those who are, are not. And to be very blunt about it, it's more political than anything else because most people in Utah would agree with that position. You can't imagine how much I'm questioned that uh, my integrity is questioned. How could a conservative Republican senator from Utah be in favor of doing away with nuclear weapons. Well, you've already heard why I'm in favor of doing away with it. But the common politics of it is that you can't verify, you can't trust, so we've got to continue to build nuclear weapons. So they're in, I guess, what would be considered the mainstream at this point. I just don't agree with that position and think we should work towards uh, that kind of a treaty, again, with guaranteed ability to verify. Yes. My name is Suzanne Powell and I'm from Rexburg, Idaho and I study anthropology and poli sci. I'm just wondering, you're talking about verification. Um, can you see of a way in, I don't know, even the sort of near future of us being able to verify um, or that have um, North Korea and Iran agree to let us verify the fact that they don't have nuclear weapons. Do you see that happening, and how would that come about? Well, first of all, talking about verification, we can certainly verify any nuclear test. That is not a problem with today's technology of doing that. We would know whether they have done a nuclear test or not. <coughs> that is not the problem. We need on-site verification where we could actually go into these countries, have an international team go in and verify what their factories were doing, whether they were producing them or not, hiding them or not. So that's the key with all of our technology today, on-site inspection for verification to make sure that they are not violating a treaty. Otherwise, I am not in favor of having a treaty unless we have that ability to really check on them in a good old-fashioned way with the eyes. My name is Paul Russell. I'm an international relations major. Um, that sounds like a, a good idea. I mean, we want to verify, but what kind of incentives would states like Iran and North Korea have to sign a treaty like that? I mean, I don't think they would believe that the U.S. would get rid of all of its nuclear weapons. What, what kind of incentives can we give them to help them want to, to do that? Well, one of the problems is we've got to try and help them change their systems internally. To give you an example, having served in Korea, the difference in North Korea and South Korea is so dramatic. They're all Koreans. And if you had the opportunity to visit Seoul and other cities in South Korea today and see what their standard of living is like, because they are free and then go visit North Korea. Night and day does not describe the difference of how talented human beings are when we are free to make our own, own choices. And so we also need to work to make this happen to give people the opportunity. I'm not talking from a military standpoint, but try and encourage them to change their form of government and that North and South Korea example is night and day does not describe the difference. You would not believe. It's like if you divided Utah County in half and one had freedom and the other didn't, you'd be amazed at that difference. So that's why 
it will take more than just a treaty that's verifiable. It will take encouragement to change, and I'm not talking when I say encouragement about military action, to change those forms of government so that people have the opportunity to make their own destinies. Yes. Hi, my name is Denise Dasatov, um, and I'm a Middle East Studies Arabic major from Manhattan Beach, California. And my question it might be a little bit difficult, but maybe you have a simple answer. I went on my mission to Japan, and um, I went to the shrines, the memorials in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And one of my favorite companions, her family, would not meet me because I'm an American. And they were in Nagasaki during the time, and they, you know, anyways, if I tell you more, I'll cry. But anyways, from that point on, I was very anti-nuclear weapon, you know, and I thought about this ever since then, and that, that was a long time ago, the 70s on my mission, and I thought, what other choice with the United States? Why didn't they choose something else to do? What else could they have done? Um, is it, is that their, was that their only solution or their only, you know, I mean, why did they have to do something so dramatic? I know I've studied it and I've read that they, it's, they said they didn't realize how destructive it would be, but I have a hard time believing that. I just want to know what other, what choice would you have chosen? What would you have done with the feelings you have now? Well, even with hindsight, I would have chosen that option. And having lived in Japan, it's, well, I'll tell you a story. I uh, lived in Iwakuni, which is just 40 kilometers south of Hiroshima. And the time I was stationed there, Hiroshima hadn't really been rebuilt. So I really saw what happened and saw it uh, quite often. We would see it from the air in our patrol missions and so on. But uh, the alternative, if you started looking at the cost of human life on both sides, Japanese, in the Western Pacific Islands, Iwo Jima and each of them as we moved up trying to eventually uh, attack Japan itself, the loss of life was very small compared to what it would have taken to actually invade the main islands of Japan, both to Americans and to Japanese and Japanese civilians. So from that perspective and a factual perspective, we saved literally hundreds of thousands of lives with the atomic attack. I'm sorry we had to do that. But if you looked at, and having spent all that time in the South Pacific and Western Pacific, if you look at what just Iwo Jima and Midway Island and some of those islands, the, the cost of life on those little tiny islands with the atolls in the, in the middle, and I know them intimately because I was flying Navy seaplanes at the time. We didn't have the ability to uh, land on a runway, all water land. I went three years without landing on a runway. So to get across the Pacific, it was from Whidbey Island, Washington, Oak Harbor, San Francisco Bay, Pearl Harbor, and then uh, up to Midway, down to Kwajalein, up to Apra Harbor in Guam. So I literally, dozens of times, have seen those islands and the loss of lives on those little, uh, I mean, just amazing how many lives were lost on both sides, just trying to get close to Japan so we could eventually attack them. And so while I wish that it hadn't had to happen, it saved, I don't know how many lives, hundreds of thousands, by not having to uh, go into Japan in a normal invasion. Over on this, oh, back there, okay, as long as you're there. Uh, my name is David Ducharme. I'm an international relations major as well. Um, do you feel that the New START treaty that President Obama and Medvedev have signed has sufficient uh, verification tools, like what you're talking about? No, I don't. And yet, uh, it doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to try to proceed and get something much more comprehensive that is verifiable. But it doesn't go far enough on the verification side, in my opinion. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Katie Chorak, and I'm studying Russian. Um, I was wondering, um, you suggested that we work actively towards this goal of a world without nuclear weapons. What kind of specific actions do you see young people like us taking to work towards this goal? Well, let me give you a broad answer to your questions. One of the things that would help dramatically, not just on this issue, but on every issue we deal with is term limits. Uh, I may not have had an opponent for a fourth term. My last two terms, none of you are old enough to know this, but my last two terms, I got 74% of the vote statewide. I may not have had an opponent for a fourth term. In fact, Governor Cal Rampton, a Democrat, held a press conference and said, we shouldn't run anybody against Senator Garner. It's just a waste of money. Let's spend our money on other races because we can't beat him. Despite being in that position, I believed in term limits, and I was the only one I could control, and so I limited my own. Now, the other thing that's interesting to me is why politicians don't understand at least what I believe is a very basic principle. If you always say what you really believe, you don't have to have a good memory. You don't have to remember what you said last week, or you don't have to say something different in San Juan County and you did in Salt Lake County or in Washington. And sometimes I got in trouble for being so candid. But I can't tell you how much easier it makes life if we are honest with each other. And Congress is not the same place that I served in right now. It's so overly partisan and personally nasty. And to illustrate that point, when I was a new senator, I met Barry Goldwater and Hubert Humphrey. Now, you could not find more political opposites than those two. Very liberal Democrat with Hubert and a very conservative Republican and Barry. But they'd have a debate on the Senate floor and then go out, go down and have dinner together in the Senate dining room, laugh about who run the debate. They were both very good friends. And those kind of relationships were important, even though you had tremendously different political philosophies, that you recognized that the Founding Fathers wanted checks and balances in Congress. That's why they had a House and a Senate, and why they developed a two-party system. And you go back there, and if you don't recognize that you can't have your own way, you're not going to accomplish very much. If you're just always the hard line on either side of the spectrum, and I still will get criticized sometimes by people who said, well, you, you compromised on this issue. And I said, yes, I did, because we wouldn't have had a solution at all. In fact, it's interesting because a woman stopped me on the streets about six months ago in Salt Lake and said, Senator, I'd like you to know I'm a liberal Democrat from South Ogden, and I voted for you every time. And I said, why? Why, if you didn't agree with me, would you vote for me? She said, I voted for your honesty, not your stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> so my point is, if we had term limits, I think you'd have a lot more directness and honesty in both parties if they couldn't test the wind and decide, I want to be here for 100 years. And there are occasionally issues come up that I wish I was still there just so I could make my position known. But it was the right decision, and we would be much better off if we had term limits. Three, give senators three six-year terms and change House terms to four years. In today's TV environment, a House member is continually running for re-election just gets reelected and the next term starts, start, or the next campaign starts. Start raising money and setting up politics, because two years is a very short period of time. So if we had term limits, give the House members four or five terms at four years each, three terms for the Senate, we would improve the behavior of Congress dramatically with those kinds of, of limitations. Yes. My name is Stephen Heinrichs. I'm from the Netherlands, and I'm studying public health. And I just had a question. Um, you spoke earlier about, um, you know, we need to keep countries in check, and there's no point in large countries like the U.S. or, or Russia disposing of their weapons when, um, 
when we can't make sure that everybody else has and that the world is safe from nuclear weapons. Um, and this, this question is not something that maybe me individually, but as a, as a kind of a general European perspective, when we've looked at some of the measures that we've seen the U.S. take uh, in the past, um, what do you think are appropriate measures to, to fight this, uh, this, this battle to, to dispose of, of uncontrolled nuclear weapons? Um, especially thinking of uh, an Iraq where there was a lot of criticism worldwide, obviously, about you know, what are appropriate measures and whatnot. What, what would you see appropriate measures or appropriate prevention uh, to uh, help solve this problem? Well, first of all, if I could snap my fingers, I would eliminate a lot of American and Russian nuclear weapons as at least a symbol that we mean what we are saying and asking you to do this because both countries have so many you could blow up the whole earth and a lot of them are old and so it doesn't make any sense to me to just talk you know words but show us some actions we're going to eliminate a few thousand weapons on both sides which would make no difference in our security most of the ones i'm talking about you could eliminate are old old technology get rid of them in other words what i'm saying is we and the Russians ought to put our uh, money where our mouths are and not just talk about it, then to encourage these others, if we would start giving up some, we would not endanger our security in any way. There, believe me, there are enough on both sides that you could eliminate three, four, seven, and we'd still have plenty of nuclear deterrent until we achieved a, a treaty. My name is Steven Schmidt, and I'm studying physics. I'm from Utah. Um, my question is basically something to do with the fact that I think a lot of people have in their minds that nuclear power is a kind of a prestigious thing that, that is like a symbol of the power of a country. And I think I wanted to know your opinion, kind of uh, how do you think we can shift that mindset um, c so that nuclear energy, well, I wanted to bring up the fact that there's these technologies for nuclear shields and nuclear defense, well, defense against things like ballistic missiles, and there was a shield that Bush was pushing for, and what is your opinion on, on how we should invest in those sort of technologies and kind of shift the mindset that our, our country's power and strength is more toward our ability to defend ourselves against, we don't, against nuclear weapons. We don't have to have nuclear weapons to defend against them necessarily. What are your thoughts on the, that subject? Well, you're correct. We don't have to have them to defend. But from a political deterrent standpoint, that's why I say we could eliminate huge amounts of them and still have the necessary deterrent from a political standpoint, even though technically you are correct. The way the politics go with it, I'm not in favor of doing away with all of ours unless everybody else does as well. And so I'm giving you a standpoint from a political, not the technical or the nuclear side, but the political side. I would not be in favor of doing away with all of ours unless we could ensure that everybody else did exactly the same, same thing. But again, my goal is far beyond nuclear weapons to get back to what I've said two or three times. We're all children of God traveling on spaceship Earth together. We need to work more fundamentally than just the count of nuclear weapons and airplanes and whatever is to our behavior with each other in our daily lives. And that's why I illustrated as strongly as I could my relationship with Alexei Leonov and how we were bitter enemies and now we're, we're brothers because we saw this earth from space. Um, I, I agree with you that we need to um, approach governments and change the structure of their governments, but I was just curious if you had any specific policies with, especially with North Korea and how the United States can approach them and, and help bring about that, that fundamental change that you're talking about. Well, the problem with a country like North Korea is when you get these dictator types that know everything and want to uh, control, no matter what you do, you're not going to change their mind. 
So what we need to try and do is work more on the aspect of trying to help their people change their form uh, of government. And that's why I use the illustration of the dramatic difference between North and South Korea, specifically because they're all Koreans. The only difference is a democracy versus a, a dictator. And that's where we've got to change more is that philosophical standpoint because you'll always have these crazy human beings. You got them in Venezuela and so on, and in South America, that they know everything and they can control and tell everybody exactly what, what to do. So the change we need is more fundamental than just getting rid of the nuclear weapons. My name is Taylor Richards. I study political science. I'm from McLean, Virginia. And my question oh, is... I only lived in McLean for 18 years. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know my grandpa, Dick Richards. Oh. Too. Um, but my question is, how practical is that to be able to change governments and to be able to change... If, we're, if the U.S. will give up all their nuclear weapons, unless everybody else does too... How possible is it for everyone else to do so if it requires these prerequisites for verification? Well, first of all, I've always had the attitude my whole life that if you don't try, you're guaranteed failure. And so no, no matter how difficult a task may be, if you don't try, the answer is, is zero. So you're correct. It's a very difficult process to change a, uh, a North Korea or Vietnam. At least uh, in Korea, we divided it. We just didn't abandon Vietnam. And I spent a lot of time flying missions in and out of Vietnam. And so I personally have seen the difference before communism and after. And dramatic does not describe that, uh, that difference. So you're right. It's difficult. But we've got to try and try and work on it. And if you look at the world's population, uh, compared to like it was before World War II and so on. As bad as it is in some countries, it's a lot better worldwide than it uh, used to be when I was your age. Um, one thing that I thought about when, when she was speaking was um, you, know, you mentioned that the U.S. has a, a lot of weapons they can get rid of and, and Russia and all that, but um, how are your feelings on the fact that it might become uh, a little bit of a, a childish dis a childish discussion discussion of, of you first? Because you mentioned, you know, we have we want to make sure that we keep some in case somebody doesn't get rid of theirs. How do we, you know, how do you get around the fact that other countries might not say, well, we want to wait until the U.S. does it or Russia or, you know, you first and then we'll go? Well, I've essentially already answered that question. Both the U.S. and Russia, in my opinion, should reduce by large amounts their nuclear weapons as a symbol or for no other reason because both countries have far more than are necessary for the defense of our, uh, our country. So symbolically, you are correct, and in my opinion, neither country should start it. It should be an agreement between the two. Be very practical and honest. We don't need these. We're going to reduce dramatically to try and help encourage the process in these other, other areas. Now, maybe that's too much common sense. I've always gotten in trouble with common sense. But any other uh, questions? Yes. Um, I was just wondering if you have any views related to uh, nuclear energy that is related to your um, views of a world without nuclear weapons? Well, I'm not a physicist, so I don't understand all the problems, but at least I've been told that the process of using nuclear fuel, fuel for nuclear energy is very different than creating a bomb. Having said that, however, I would much prefer still in the longer term to look at other alternative sources of energy rather than uh, nuclear. And uh, at least you're seeing in wind uh, rather a, a large change in, in that area. 
and you can't ask for a cleaner, better way to develop electrical energy than through wind power. And it has no impact other than those big, ugly turbines that you have to, uh, have to look at. But I would prefer to go the direction you're, you're talking about. Hi, uh, Rodney Vessels, political science major. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, I think you know, some realists uh, argue that you know, having nuclear weapons is a deterrent and that there hasn't been great power conflict since nuclear weapons. We haven't seen a, you know, a Germany or Japan um, you know, attack or whatnot. And yeah, there's been wars and skirmishes, but in, I, I know I think some realists uh, argue that there hasn't been huge conflict, and so if you take nuclear weapons out of the picture, the idea that there will be no conflict in the world is, I think, unrealistic. And so if you have the goal of no nuclear weapons, well, then what other conflict may occur from that? What may, may be the side effect of no, no nuclear weapons? Well, you're correct. Doing away with nuclear weapons is not going to solve the other problems that we've talked about here today. But I think there are two distinctly different issues. To do away with that possibility of such huge, massive destruction would be helpful. But it gets back to my comments about having seen this Earth from space. We've got to solve our internal relationships and not have these artificial, forget the military, forget Army, Navy, anything else, or nuclear weapons. We've got to start in that basic pattern of how do we treat each other. And uh, I mean, I'm Scotch, Welsh, Dutch, Norwegian, Danish, and English. So that's pretty good mixture. The Garns were from, from Amsterdam. My great grandfather was born in Amsterdam. But the point of it is, it's one advantage we Americans have. I'm a mixture of several nationalities and that's where we need to work beyond the issue of nuclear weapons or ordinary conventional weapons or armies or navies or anything else. Let's get back to that point I've made several times. We're all children of God traveling on Spaceship Earth together and how we treat each other individually. I'm not talking about nationally, internationally. What are our manners with each other? And do we make these artificial unfair distinctions about people? And that's where we've really got to work to improve that we are, again, we're all traveling on Spaceship Earth together. Um, how about the old-fashioned, let's be nice to each other in our daily and business uh, relationships. I have a very hard time understanding, just here in, in Utah, some of the business situations that I've been in. I was on one board that uh, I resigned from, cost me me a lot of money and my wife wasn't too happy. But I didn't like the internal relationships of some of the management. And so it isn't just nationally and internationally, down to the fundamental basics of children of God, how do we treat each other? And I couldn't stand these management people that were so selfish and so arrogant that they were fighting internally and hurting their own business. So it's very basic in getting back to our basic relationships with each other and how we treat each other as fellow human beings and not placing people on pedestals or way down low for nonsensical uh, reasons whatsoever. So our personal relationships need to improve dramatically and our personal biases uh, taken away. Well, I appreciate the opportunity of, of being with you, and the main thing I want to leave with you is the importance of what you are doing, education, training your brain. Because if little Jake Garn from Richfield, Utah, ever in my wildest imaginations thought that I would have the opportunities that I've had in my lifetime, not possible, and I still have a wild imagination. So look at yourselves individually and how fortunate you are to live in the United States, to be free, to make choices for yourself, to train your brains, 
and then someday you can come back and talk to students here on the campus and talk about all the amazing things that you've been able to accomplish and the changes that have occurred in your, in your lifetime. It just, I, I still can't even comprehend. I, I was 16 before I ever saw TV and one of my grandchildren said, well, why? Were your mommy and daddy cheap? They wouldn't buy one? I said, no, it didn't exist. It wasn't being broadcast until I was 16 years old. Interestingly enough, uh, when I uh, married my first wife, I found out that Philo Farnsworth was her uncle. So the inventor of TV became my uncle. And it was interesting because uh, his teacher, when he was 14, and Mr. Justin Tolman, who was the man that helped him get his patents over RCA because he testified that when he was 14 years old, he had told his algebra teacher about how TV would, would work. Well, Mr. Tolman happened to be my algebra teacher at Roosevelt Junior High School in Salt Lake City. So I went back to see him after Philo became my uncle by marriage, and I said, uh, oh, Philo Farnsworth is my uncle. And he said, oh, Senator, if I had known that, you would have gotten A's in my class. <laughs> and I said, I did, Mr. Farnsworth, or Mr. <laughs> Tolman, all by myself without Philo Farnsworth's uh, help. So anyway, uh, Good luck to you, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today.